Good morning, Hope Church. Good morning, everyone. It's um, it's really good to be with you this morning. My name's Tom, and you're in my bedroom here in Bedlington, and you're so welcome. You really are welcome this morning. We want you to feel connected to one another and to our living God this morning, and I hope that you're starting to feel that just as you see all of those comments rolling in in the comments section. So good to know that we're in this with so many other people. We want you to know as well this morning that you are loved. So share the love this morning, share it amongst each other, share God's love with each other, share your love with each other. We want you to know that you're valuable. You're so valued this morning that your life was worth everything to God, so much so that he gave up his own life for you. And so we're going to worship. We're going to start with worship in just a sec. Uh, Gaz is ready. Um, but before we do that, I want to take a second uh, for us to be still. I want to take a second, just a second, for us to all invite the presence of God into um, our lives again, wherever we are, afresh. A second for us to focus our senses on God. Today is traditionally the start of Advent for the church. I mean, that is the period of preparing for the coming of Christ, of waiting and longing and getting ready for Jesus. And so we say traditionally as a church on this, during this time, come Lord Jesus. We say this knowing that he has come and that he will come again. We say this with both the satisfaction of knowing that he is our king and our rescuer, but we also say it with the longing and the pain that we see and we know and we feel all around us. We say, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus, we pray. We're going to enter into a week of prayer and fasting starts tomorrow. Um, I don't know if this fills you with a sense of trepidation and anxiety or if it helps you to feel really excited and challenged. Um, but I am excited about this. This is a good thing. This is something that we're really excited to do as a church. And if you've missed out the videos so far, just um, helping us get ready for that. Do check them out on our videos page last Friday, three Friday reflections, a Christmas challenge, um, a hum humble prayer and a call to pray. And so to start off this week, um, this exciting and challenging and important season for us, let us take a, a, a second to focus on the presence of God, to focus on his voice. What is he saying to you this morning? What is he saying to us as a church? Maybe you're going to get a picture, maybe a scripture, maybe an encouragement, maybe just a feeling, maybe just a sense of peace. And just maybe you'll feel like this is right to share uh, for everyone. And so we have a comment section. Please share your encouragements this morning. That's what we want to see. We want to see us going beyond the greetings and into the presence of God, hearing from him together. Pop that in the comments or send it via messenger if you want to send it to one of our team. and We'll look at it there. But now together, let us focus. Let us focus our senses on the presence of God as we pray. Come, Lord Jesus. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. 
Yes, I am who you say I am. Father God, we relish the freedom that's ours this morning. Freedom that's in you, Father God. Let's sing, Who I am, who am I that the highest king? I that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but it brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me, oh his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me, yes he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. Oh God, yes I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child. Of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm the child of God, yes I am. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, you're against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am.
Hallelujah. Father God, thank you that you chose us as your children. Thank you, Father, that you can take away all of our hurts, that your arms are open wide for us this morning, God. The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide for forgiveness. Yours bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrow and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was poured with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen Bow down before Him For He is Lord of all Sing hallelujah Christ is risen Oh, what a say Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow 
bow down before him for he is lord of all sing hallelujah christ is risen oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Back to you, Tom. Amen. Thank you, Gary. So good to worship together. So good to know that we can come to God and the sacrifice has been made um, and that his arms are open wide to us. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, we are having a few technical issues. We've had a, a block on the live stream because of um, potential copyright infringement. We have a license, so we haven't broken copyright playing those songs, but um, Facebook uses algorithms and obviously we can't talk to it live. So um, if you drop off the feed, you won't be able to get back onto it now. Um, which means I, it's very tempting, I know, to flick around on Facebook and look, but I would recommend that you stay connected until the end. But obviously we're recording this and we'll stick it back up uh, if you've lost it or if you do lose it at some point and you'll be able to catch up again. Um, we are going into our week of prayer. Um, we're going to start that tomorrow. We're going to be praying through the, the Acts model, the adore, the model of adoring God, confessing our sin giving thanks and prayers of supplication that is asking and petitioning God within his will for what um, could happen amongst us. We're praying into Second Chronicles chapter 7, 14, that uh, we would be able to humble ourselves, repent, seek the face of God and he will heal, heal our land. And we're going to be doing that morning, midday and evening every single day together trusting that we are all committed to this next week on tuesday we're going to um, particularly on tuesday we're going to fast as well we're going to fast together and we're going to have uh, three guided prayer moments morning um afternoon and evening where you'll get them via email and then we'll go we'll join together at 7 30 on tuesday evening for our connect prayer meeting on zoom if you don't get our emails and you'd like to be part of that please do pop us a message and we'll add your email to the email list and you'll get those um, those updates too. And we're going to finish the week on um, Sunday by breaking bread together, to looking back and remembering what Jesus has done for us as we look forward as part of this Advent to Christ's coming. We've also got a carol service on the 13th, a great one to invite your friends to. We are going to stay on Facebook Live. We are going to do it live. Um, so we're staying in this format for that. And we want to encourage you to share the event widely uh, if you click interested or if you click that you are going on the event then it helps spread the word and helps other people your friends and other people um, that are connected to you on facebook see that you're going to that event which brings up its visibility so uh, you can find that in our events page on the events tab if you click that in the page and do let us know that you're coming and do share the event widely it's going to be a tradition we're going to sing some traditional carols together and hopefully that will just be another moment where we can look forward to the coming of Jesus. After this meeting, we have two things that you can do. We have an after church chat. If you're new to us, if you're first time here, if you've got any questions, then a couple of our leaders, Den and Kay, they'll be on the chat. 
that link will come up in the comments and we would love you to join that to zoom chat just to ask whatever you want really just to connect and say hi even um, i encourage you to do that it's a bold step i know a brave step but really worthwhile and then also we have two uh, an older kids church and a younger kids church young kids church and older kids church after our meeting starting on zoom too if you have children and they're not part of that and you'd like them to be then contact us via messenger and we'll have a chat about that and show you how to become part of our kids church during this time but that's it from me i'm really excited to hand over to helen now as the good news continues over to you helen thanks tom good morning everybody um let me just start this morning by reading a verse from um psalm 119 105 which says your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path you know when we read god's word the bible we do so because we we want to know god's heart don't we we want to we want to know his wisdom it's why we prioritize reading and studying the Bible. It's in reading God's word that he shows us where to go. He teaches us what to say. He enables us to make good decisions. His word also reveals when we're getting things wrong and it, and it warns us of the consequences. Um, and a little further on in that Psalm, it says the unfolding of your word gives light. You know, why do we as a church explore and study Acts on a Sunday? It's because we want God's word to, to cause spiritual growth in us. And for me today, this passage that we're going to look at is just so full of heart challenges for us today. And I want to give you a fair warning that actually I think some of these heart challenges that we will see today in our passage will really cut to the bone for some of us today. But as we read through the, 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 through the scripture today, I, I want you to do some work with me this morning. I want you to think about what it's saying to you and what your heart response is going to be to it. You know, as we are together challenged and learned from a number of different people in this passage, I just want to, I just want to think about what kind of heart do we want to cultivate in ourselves? You know, what heart response do we want to have to the situations that we find ourselves in? And if you've heard me speak before, you'll know that I'm somebody who likes to think about the big picture in scripture. I like the history. If you know me personally, you'll know that I like thinking about theology, you know, different ways of, look, of looking at different kind of issues in the Bible, cultural things, thinking about the way we do things in church or don't do things in church. And there's so much in this passage. Some things actually really, really close to my heart um, that were very tempting for me to speak on today. But as I prayed about this preach, I just felt God speak me, direct me not to speak on those things, not to speak on the details, if you like, or I guess to go in some ways go into too much depth, but instead to think about a heart's response, to think about a heart condition today, and to think about what kind of heart we are seeking to cultivate in ourselves. And as we as a church go into more focused Advent season that Tom was talking about of prayer and fasting, I feel like God wants to start a heart work in some of us today, that he's going to continue to work in over the coming weeks and months if we choose to give our hearts over to the potter's hand, you know, allowing him to mould us. And I believe that God is seeking to, to ready our hearts as a church community for the mission that he will call us into as a church community over the coming months and years. But it starts with positioning our hearts right before him. So are we up for that? Are we, are we up for a health check, a heart health check this morning? Let's delve in. Just for clarity, um, just as a little reminder of where we are in Acts, um, Paul has now gone his separate way to Barnabas, um, which Dan explained last week, and he's taken with him Silas, and he's now also asked a guy called Timothy, who is half Greek and half Jewish in origin, to travel with him on this second missionary journey that he's going to go on. So Acts 16 verses 6 to 12 says, Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen this vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God has called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and, and, sailed, through, sorry, and sailed straight for Samothrace. And the next day we went to Neapolis. 
From there, we travelled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. So Paul makes some travel plans, okay? Plans of where he's going to go next to preach the gospel. But his plans are quickly interrupted by God here. The Holy Spirit prohibits them from teaching Amijah, so they change course. They tried to head for Bithynia, but again, the Holy Spirit says no. So they go down to Troas, where Paul has this vision of a man in Macedonia, northern Greece, begging him to come over to Macedonia, to Europe, and to help them. And immediately, Paul responds and he readies them for travel to Macedonia. You see, what we see in Paul here is that he has a heart that responds to the Holy Spirit. You know, he has a plan, but he is comfortable with the Spirit changing his plan, changing his course. You know, let me ask you today, are you cultivating a heart in yourself? Do do we have a heart as a church community that is responsive to the Holy Spirit? You know, are we meditating on the word of God? Are we listening for his voice each day? You know, as you go about your, your days, are you giving him a look in? God, what would you have me do today in this situation? God, is there a need you want me to see and meet today? You know, Psalm 63 says, my soul follows close behind you. you know, can we say that of ourselves? So I'm somebody who loves a good planning session. You know, I think that making God's plans for our lives a reality does actually require us to plan. So if I want to draw if I want to draw close to God, knowing he'll draw close to me, then I know that I need to ta- that I need to plan in time with God, time to meditate on his word, time to worship him, time to pray, time to be alone with him. If I don't plan that in, it just doesn't happen. You know, practically, I am somebody who likes to have a plan. I like to ha- I like to plan my week my my time in the week. In my head, I like to have a longer term plan. You know, I have a plan that in three years time, I will eventually finish my GP training and I'll get a job working in a GP surgery and I'll do some A&E on the side as well. But, you know, as I read through this passage, I just felt God challenge my heart on this, you know, and say to me, what if I interrupt your plan? Would you be okay if like Paul is here, if your plan is interrupted by my plan for you? Ooh, you see... We can have a plan. Paul had a plan. I think God's okay with us having a plan. I think the problem only arises when we hold our plans so tightly that we're not okay with God interrupting them. Paul was responsive to God's spirit. Are we being responsive to God's spirit? It may not be in such a dramatic way as Paul had to respond here, but are we welcoming God into all of our plans, whether that's for today, simply this afternoon? Or for the next three, five years and inviting his Holy Spirit to speak in, to direct, to guide and sometimes if needed even to change our plans because he might have a better plan for us. You know, are we giving him space in our lives and our hearts for him to speak in? Are we cultivating a heart in ourselves that is responsive and open to the Holy Spirit, ready to listen, ready to learn, ready to respond? You know, this isn't personality dependent. This isn't dependent on if you are a natural risk taker or someone who's willing to kind of change plans quite easily. It's simply about having a heart that's willing to hear what God might have to say. You know, somebody this week sent me um, a really beautiful email, actually, with a a dream that they'd had about me, um, which they felt was from God. um, And some words that they felt God was speaking to me about through this and that they felt God was prompting them to share with me. And the person who sent this is very much an introvert. They would say that of themselves. And them sharing this with me required them to to really step out of their comfort zone in order to send that email. But for me receiving that, it was one of the most kind of beautiful, most most powerful encouragements that I've had in, in quite a long time. And it spoke to me exactly where I was at. It was exactly what I needed when I read it. And God just used that just to really um, lift my soul and just encourage me this week. And that is a person who was listening for God, you know, who was prepared to be interrupted by God, to think on it, to step out of their natural comfort zone and respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing. That's the heart we want to cultivate in ourselves, a heart that is responsive to the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 carries on. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. 
One one of those listening was a woman from the from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us into their home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So Paul arrives at Philippi and he does what Paul always does when he arrives somewhere new. Something which Kay explained to us a few weeks back. He goes to find the synagogue so that he can preach first to the Jews so that they can then go, to, go on to bless those around them. And then he'll go and preach to the Gentiles. But there's a problem here for Paul. There is no synagogue for him to go to, to, to pray in, to preach it in. You know, it took 10 male believers to constitute a synagogue. But in Philippi, it didn't exist. It indicates that there wasn't 10 male believers in Philippi. Such was the lack of recognition of God in this city. So instead, God chooses to found the church in Philippi with a group of women, which was so culturally not the norm at the time. And Paul meets this woman called Lydia, and Lydia is a really successful businesswoman. You know, purple is the colour of royalty. She is an influential person in the city. And God opens her heart to believe the gospel. And in turn, she opens her home and invites Paul to gather the first church in Philippi into her home. Now, this is the first European church planted, and it's gathering inside Lydia's home. Why? Because Lydia has a heart that serves. Lydia has a heart that sees need and meets it. There is no synagogue to gather people. There is no central place for the gospel to be preached. So Lydia offers up her home, but more than that, she offers up her comfort, her personal space, her energy for the purpose of the gospel advancing in Philippi. You know, she sees need and she meets it. You know, how are we doing with that? You know, it's a strange time with COVID, you know, serving others is probably harder to do right now. We've in many ways been pushed into these little bubbles, which often, but not always, are quite nice little comfort zones for us. Oh, but are we still cultivating a heart in ourselves that doesn't just look to ourselves and our immediate family or our little bubble at this time, but actually sees the needs of others around us? You know, are we cultivating a heart in ourselves that seeks to serve others? Are we willing to give our homes when allowed, you know, our personal space, our time, our energy, our resources, ourselves for the purpose of the gospel advancing? You know, for the purpose of loving the lost and the broken? Are we cultivating in ourselves not an inward looking heart, but an outward looking heart? Lydia had a heart that was ready and quick to serve. Do we have hearts that serve? Verse 16 carries on. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a fam female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. You know, Paul demonstrates here that he has a heart that understands and knows the power of Jesus. At the final trial before Jesus is crucified, when Jesus stood before the high priest and was asked, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? What does Jesus say in Mark 14? He says, I am, and you shall see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power. And it's God, power that gives all authority on heaven and earth to Jesus in Matthew 28 we see and what does Jesus say to his followers in John 14 very truly I tell you whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the father you know Paul knows that he doesn't have to fight with this unclean spirit for victory but that he commands it from a place of victory that is already won by Jesus Christ on the cross that's why he can say with calmness and confidence and boldness in the name of Jesus I command you to come out and the spirit obeys because he knows that Jesus has all authority of heaven and earth and that Jesus has already won these battles for us you know that truth is as true today as it was in Paul's day because the cross of Jesus carries as much power today as it did when Paul walked this earth 
And as Christians, we have a commission from Jesus to go into all the world and make disciples. And Jesus does not send us out to do kingdom work without equipping us for the job. Paul says, you know, may the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. It's by faith that Paul and the disciples perform miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. We have the same power they had within us. You know, the power of the Holy Spirit when we place our faith in him as Lord. So do we have hearts that believe that? You know, do we have hearts that know the power of the name of Jesus? Do we have hearts that are inviting the Holy Spirit to live in them so that we can know his power in our lives? You know, are we from that place daring to ask God for the miraculous and the supernatural in faith? Knowing that we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us and understanding the power of Jesus. You know, let's be bold. Let's ask to know and see more of the, of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Let's cultivate hearts that truly understand and know the power of Jesus. Verse 19 continues, when the owners realised that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or to practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas had a heart that worshipped God. You know, I don't know about you, but I can imagine myself in that situation. And if I'm honest, I'm pretty sure I may well have been sulking or complaining. But they didn't do that. They knew that their most powerful weapon in time of real hardship um, was prayer and worship. Their joy was found not in their circumstance. Their joy was found in the person of Jesus. You know, that's why we call the church together um, at the moment. That's why we want to call the church together at a moment for a time of prayer and fasting in the season. Because we know that that's our most powerful weapon. You know, again and again through scripture, we see God respond to prayer. And we see in Paul and Silas here that when, you know, when the gospel, when the Holy Spirit is at work in the hearts of those who are faithful to Jesus, that it raises them to a higher level of worship. You know, to pray, to sing hymns, to rejoice in a time of being beaten and tortured and imprisoned, defied human reasoning. But it was this, it was prayer, it was worship that was the foundation of everything that transpired from here on in this story. You know, what about us? Do we have hearts that worship Jesus? In times of hardship and challenge, like this COVID pandemic that we're in right now, do we recognise that our most powerful weapons are prayer and worship? You know, is our joy found not in our circumstance, but in the person of Jesus? Are we cultivating in ourselves a heart of worship? Verse 26 carries on. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when they saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptised. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, he and his whole household. You know, let's just look at the jailer first in this. You know, he's hurt Paul and Silas. He's probably pushed them around. He's put chains around their ankles. He's probably been quite brutal at, um, towards Paul and Silas. 
And suddenly there's this, there's this earthquake and the prison doors fly open and he wakes up and he's filled with fear at the thought that the prisoners had escaped, knowing he'd be held responsible and probably be tortured and even killed himself. But Paul says to him, no, don't kill yourself. And the jailer runs in and he sees Paul and Silas are there. And the jailer sees the power of God is at work here. And he asks Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas speak the gospel to him and his household. And, are, and, and he and his household are changed by it. He takes Paul and Silas home, he serves, he tends their wounds, he feeds them, he looks after them. And he's filled with joy because he comes to believe in God. The jailer has a heart that was changed by God as he saw and he understood the power of the, and truth of the gospel. You know, have our hearts been changed by God? Have we seen and understand the full power and the truth of the gospel? You know, do we recognise the impact of the gospel that we preach has the power to do this for other people, to change their hearts, to change them in the moment, to make them new? The gospel has the power to change a heart in a second. And that's what we see here in the jailer, a heart that is radically changed by God. And what about Paul and Silas in this? You know, we have a man, the jailer, who has inflicted hardship and pain on Silas and Paul. And God intervenes in Paul and Silas' situation and the jailer sees God's power at work and he says to Paul, what must I do to be saved? Now, let me ask you, how would you have answered that question to the jailer? You know, if you are somebody who's been hurt by the jailer because he's tightly fastened your chains around your ankles, he's treated you badly, maybe he's refused to give you, you know, food or water, you might say an answer to his question. Well, you know, if you're willing to make amends of those people like me who you've hurt and then you lay your sins at the cross of Jesus, then you can be saved. Or maybe you might be someone who's just really angry at the jailer, a bit disgusted by his behaviours. You know, the way he's trapped people badly or abused his position in some way, maybe. So you might say to the jailer, when asked by him, what must I do to be saved? If you repent and deal with your sin in your mess and you sort yourself out, then you can come to the cross of Jesus and plead with him for mercy. Or if you are someone who's quite, I don't know, zealous, likes order in the way things happen, you might answer the jailer's question by saying, well, let's take a few weeks, let's study the Bible, let's pray, let's go to church together first, then we'll see how things go for a while, and then you can decide if you are ready to commit to Jesus in a few weeks. But Paul doesn't say any of that. He doesn't put conditions on the jailer. Paul simply answer him, answers him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Paul points him freely to Jesus. Paul has a heart that is soft toward people around him. You know, this is the beautiful simplicity of the gospel. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. And I just wanna say this morning to anybody who's listening, who doesn't know Jesus, who might feel like it's complicated to get to know Jesus and to be a Christian, that actually the reality of the gospel message is really that simple. Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. You know, he will meet you where you're at and you can experience his love and his grace in that place right now. That's the truth. That's the gospel. And for those of us who are Christians already, you know, let's stop complicating the gospel for people. You know, let's follow the beautiful example of Paul. We're not there to be a gatekeeper for God. You know, you qualify, you don't. You've got your life sorted enough, you haven't. You have that sin in your life, you can't know Jesus. Because that's not the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel is as simple as Paul makes it here. What must someone do to be saved? Believe in Jesus and you will be saved. You know, once we know Jesus, he takes our hearts and he transforms us. That's not our job. It's not my job to transform somebody else, but it is my job to surrender my own heart to God. You know, a heart surrendered to Jesus, a heart surrendered to the potter, sees all people through the lens of the love of the Father. It's soft to those around them. And that is why Jesus could sit alongside the prostitute, the sexually immoral at the time. That's why Jesus could welcome into his kingdom the thief hanging on the cross beside him. That is why Jesus could invite the murderer into his family. 
because he knew that he was making a route forward for us, that for us, because of him, it's so simple for us. Believe in Jesus and we will be saved. It wasn't simple for him. The path he carved for us required him to walk a path of pain and suffering and death and separation from the Father. You know, Paul's response to the jailer was not bitterness at the way he'd been trapped by the God. Paul's response was not superiority or judgmentalism. You know, tick these boxes and you, you can be a Christian, you can come to our church. Paul's response was not legalistic. Paul had a heart that was soft to those around him. He sees people around him through the lens of the love that God has for them. His response came from a heart surrendered to Jesus so that he was able to show the grace and the love of Jesus and share the simplicity of the truth of the gospel, even to those who have hurt him and wronged him. Believe in Jesus, you will be saved. That's what matters. That's what's important to God. God does the rest. God changes heart. God's, God convicts sin in our lives. God transforms. And he's doing a transformational work in each of us. It's not me and you doing it. It's God doing it. You know, what about us? Do we have hearts that are soft to those around us? Do we see people around us through the lens of the love of the Father for that person? You know, hearts that are ready to forgive, hearts that are ready to point people to Jesus, hearts that aren't filled with judgmentalism and superiority or legalism or criticism, but are filled with the love and the grace of Jesus. We are not called to have hearts that are hard and harsh towards our brothers and sisters around us, but we are called to have hearts that are soft to those around us. Because soft hearts leads to love. And Jesus asks us not just to love our friends, but to love our enemies as well, to love those who hurt us. Paul's heart is soft and from that, he's able to love the man, the jailer who hurt him. You know, are we cultivating soft hearts in ourselves? And you know, often that starts on your knees before God in prayer. Father, that person's really hurt me. Help me to love them. Help me to choose my words towards them wisely. Help me to be gentle in my words and my deeds towards them. Help me to listen. Help me not to speak critically of them. Change my heart, God. Make it soft. Are we cultivating a heart that is soft to those around us? And then the final bit, verse 35, when it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the, officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. You know, that's pretty bold of Paul, isn't it? You know, he could have just quietly walked away so he didn't have to face any more potential conflict or trouble for himself. He didn't need this hassle. But instead, he insists on calling out the truth. You know, what happened here wasn't just, it was illegal to harm a Roman citizen without fair trial first, which didn't happen here. So he calls out the injustice. You know, Paul has a heart that is bold and strong. He knows when to call out the truth and he does it. He knows how and when to bring challenge when needed. But he also has a heart that submits to the authorities as God asks us to. You know, the authorities ask him to leave after he's called out the truth for them. So he goes to say goodbye to Lydia in the church and then he does leave. You know, there's such wisdom in that, isn't there? You know, he knows when to be bold and to stand up for justice and he's not afraid of that. But he also knows that he's called by God to obey earthly authorities. So he does as they ask of him. You know, what about us? Do we have hearts that are bold and strong to call out injustice when needed? Are we willing to defend the rights of the poor and the broken and the needy, even when that might cost us? You know, are we willing to be a voice for those who aren't able to be a voice for themselves? But are we also able to honour those who God has asked us to honour? Can we submit to earthly authorities, the governments, pray for them, honour them, even when we don't agree with them? That takes wisdom to do both of those things well. It takes prayer again. You know, Father, give me a wise heart that is bold and strong and willing to call out injustice and stand up for those who need defending at the right time. 
And you know, we as a church, we feel called to, ser to serve and to love the poor and the broken. And those people will sometimes need us to be bold and strong for them, to be willing to be a voice for them, to be willing to speak truth and call out injustice. So let's be preparing our hearts now, asking God to give us wisdom, to have hearts that are bold and strong. You know, I've done a really rapid whistle stop tour through this passage, looking at some of the heart responses we see and can learn from and the different characters in this passage. But my prayer is that this week, you will take some time with God just to reflect on these things, to reflect on your own heart condition, to do a bit of a heart health check on yourself and to reflect on whether you are cultivating a heart in yourself, like we see in these amazing people that we've read about today. Do you have a heart that is responsive to the Holy Spirit? Do you have a heart that serves? Do you have a heart that knows the power of Jesus? Do you have a heart that worships? Do you have a heart that has been changed by God? Do you have a heart that is soft to those around you? Do you have a heart that is bold and strong? And for some of us today, thinking of these questions will raise a heart response in us. For some of us, the Holy Spirit will prod something in our hearts right now through this week. You know, oh, maybe my heart isn't positioned to be responsive to the Holy Spirit. Maybe my heart's position isn't one of worship right now, but more of complaining and sulking. Maybe it's been a long time since you've allowed God to mould your heart. Maybe your response to those around you isn't one of softness and love and grace, but is one of hardness and anger and resentment. And can I just encourage you as you think about these questions and ask God to speak into this stuff? God's heart for us in this is not condemnation, but his heart for you is freedom and transformation. And transformation doesn't come from trying really, really, really hard to get something right and to change it in yourself. And I've had to learn this lesson. But transformation comes from surrender. It's not in your own effort that your heart will be changed, but it's in surrender to God. Paul and Silas were surrendered to God, this enabled living, spiritual living. It enabled them to have hearts that were both strong and bold, but also gentle and forgiving and soft towards people. It's in surrender that Paul was able to respond to the Holy Spirit, able to stand confidently in the knowledge of the power of Jesus. It's in surrender that no matter what situation Paul found himself in, that he could have a heart filled with the joy of the Lord. It's in surrender that we too can have hearts like Paul and Silas, Lydia and the jailer. Hearts that are being transformed by God through our surrender to him. We're going to sing another song together that Gary's kindly going to lead us in. But why don't you just invite as we do that the Holy Spirit just to speak to you on your heart condition today right now. You know, why don't you ask God to show you the areas of your heart that he wants to transform today. And then surrender those things back to him. You know, Father, I surrender these broken bits of my heart to you. Change me, not through my effort, but through your power at work in me. You know, help me to have a heart like yours. Let's just pray together. Father, I just thank you, God, that you are doing a transformational work in each of us, Father. And God, I thank you that that doesn't come for our own effort, God. It doesn't come through us working really hard, God, but it comes through surrender to you, Jesus. And God, I just pray that this week that each of us can just spend some time reflecting on our heart condition, God reflecting on areas that maybe you want to speak to us individually about, areas that we need your transformational hand in, God. And Father, I just pray that we can position ourselves in a posture of surrender to you, Jesus, and allow you to do the work in our hearts that we need doing, God. God, be amongst us as a church community. Be amongst us, Father, as we seek to, to glorify you in the way we live our lives, God. Amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe 
We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those who Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we can put our trust in you. Thank you, Father, that you hold our hearts. Thank you, Father, that you help us to reach out to others in your strength. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, Father God. Come among us now, we pray. Empower us, Father, to reach out to others, to show your love, to show your peace, to show your joy. To those around us, Father God, help us to reach out in your precious name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Back to you, Tom.
Amen. Um, thank you so much, Gary, Helen, uh, Crawford, Steve, Paul, everyone that's been serving this morning. A wonderful job. Um, it's us as a team behind the scenes can't tell if you're watching at the moment. So it's felt a little bit uh, lonely. We haven't seen the comments, but if you've stuck with this and you're managing to still be here and, and receive this feed, then um, well done. And I pray that you'll take that encouragement, that heart condition encouragement, that responsive heart, a serving heart, a heart that knows the power of Jesus, a heart that worships, a heart that is changed by God, is soft to those around us and a heart that is bold and strong. It seems like such a big list, doesn't it? And it can be, feel so challenging, but as Helen said at the end, actually we find these things when we surrender to Jesus. So as we enter our week of prayer and fasting together, um, I just pray that we'll find time to, to listen to God and to allow him to speak to the condition of our heart. Not because um, there's anything that we can do about it, but that in the surrender, we can allow him to start to change our heart. And maybe we can be the hands of feet and Jesus to those around us this week. So um, it's been wonderful to be together. Um, I'm really looking forward to this prayer of week, uh, this week of prayer and fasting. And um, I'm so grateful to, to be in this with you. And I hope that you're grateful to be in this with us too. And um, I'm praying this week for our condition of our heart, for our connectedness with one another, for our connectedness with those around us, the communities around us and our connectedness with God. And that we will see um, a week that is different to the weeks that we've experienced before and a week that is full of the power of God, the mercy of God and the, tr the life transforming um, nature of God in our lives. So we've got kids now, kids church, and we've got the after church chat as well. And um, I want to pray that you'd go in peace. May God keep you and bless you. And I really look forward to hopefully seeing you on Tuesday. And but that's all from us now. Goodbye. <laughs>